good afternoon. Thank you for coming. We will have an uh, hopefully and I'm sure interesting talk uh, about uh, crypto enabled time travel by Spiros Dovas. Thank you for coming from Thank Greece. He suggested that I don't do a long introduction because the uh, content will speak for itself and then we can um, we can talk about it at the end so yes, so let's uh, let's do it okay thank you Welcome. thank you Uri. good to be here and thank you all for for coming so um, we're going to discuss about crypto enabled time travel and um, I have not used it. Okay, so I did not arrive from the future or from the past. I'm still in the present. I have, uh, I have been. I'm going to discuss this quite um, opaque title that I, I had there, uh, addressing the terms on it in a reverse order. So first, I'm going uh, to discuss what I mean by time travel, and then point out what. Uh oh. It does not seem to work very well, sorry. Yeah? Oh, come on. Yes, let's discuss about why it needs to be enabled by something and this something, why this something is crypto and um, what kind of uh, crypto. Can I have this? It's going to be better, maybe. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the pointer is the red one? Yes. Good. Okay. So, what time travel is, why it needs to be enabled by something, and why this something is crypto and what kind of crypto. So, this is going to be the, the structure of this presentation today. And um, talking about time travel, we are discussing, to relate it with the theme of this Congress, we're discussing about temporal opt out. It's truly the decision that someone can make to abandon the present times altogether, hoping to arrive in a better future. Um, and I want to test the waters here and see what the attitude of the audience about the future is by asking you, given that you had the chance, would you prefer to have had been born as a random person uh, 100 years in the future? Oh, come on. Show of hands? Not that many. How about 400 years in the future? Oh, that's better. <laughs> How about 1,000 years in the future? OK. I don't ask you about the past, because I don't think a sane person would choose to be born a random person in, in the past, you know, given what humanity has been in the past. So time travel has been uh, it's, it's the optimal, ultimate opt out well, what you can do it's not for everybody time travel has been in the um, in the minds of the people through uh, the the art um, since more than 150 years so we had uh, this kind of time machines pro uh, produced by fiction writers we had back to the future but i'm not here to discuss to you about this kind of time travel that has been uh, popularized what i'm going to discuss because with you is a very specific kind of time travel. It has a few constraints, let's say. The first one, it's as, it is that it's unidirectional, so we can travel only to the future, not to the past. Okay? The second one is that we cannot accurately set the date where we want to arrive, like we did with uh, uh, Back to the Future, with some accuracy there. And also, it's not permissionless. You cannot just zap yourself you know, to the future and then land uh, somewhere without other people collaborating for this to happen. These constraints have been imposed because the technology that I'm, I'm going to discuss about is cryonics. You may know about this. Cryonics is a technology that freezes people, dead people mostly, in a very low temperature, and then hope, hopefully they're going to revive them in the future where the technology to do so will be available. Again, it has been depicted in popular science in, uh, in various ways. The reality is much more mundane, I'm afraid. So these are tanks where people are being cryopreserved by Alcor, one of the major companies in the space. In the small people have chosen just to preserve their heads. 
so that when the technology is available to upload their consciousness into the cloud, they will not need the bodies, you know, so they chose this. It's also less complicated and cheaper for them to have this kind of uh, preservation. This is an installation in Russia, so it's not, you know, very fancy stuff, but it happens already. And there is skepticism related to this, and some people I see frowned upon when I said that I'm going to discuss about cryonics. And this skepticism is um, mainly on three areas, let's say. It has uh, th th three topics of um, criticism. The first one is the technical capability. Could we do it if this can be done? And um, it's, it's a technology that's under development and it's not yet completed, apparently. And um, there is work that is currently being done on both ends, let's say. So there is um, an effort, an ongoing effort, to be able to freeze people in, uh, in a better way so that their tissues are being better preserved. S and also there is work being done, so this vitrification, and in the beginning they were just freezing the people, you know, because it was a crude uh, way, they didn't know much. But you realize that when you free someone that has uh, water content in their body, this water tends to turns it into ice, and ice is crystallic and also has a bigger volume than the liquid water, so this tends to destroy the tissues. So they developed a technology called vitrification, where you actually take out all the blood and most of the water content, and then you replace it with a specific fluid that um, preserves its uh, properties in a very low temperature. It goes easy, very, very easy on the tissues. And on the restoration side, there is work being done by engineering and technology and medical science so that to arrive at a position where we can get a well-preserved body and defreeze it in a controlled way so that a person can be operational again. Now, this is not being done for persons now, but it's, it's being done for instruments that are given for transplant. You know, they are frozen and then they are unfrozen and put into people and they operate. It's very far, we are very far from doing this with our minds, retain consciousness, retain memory, of course. But somehow we have frozen tissues and then put them back in normal temperature and see them operate. So we, we are on our way there. I think it's, since we're going to discuss about time travel, it's interesting to uh, have in our minds this idea that this process is a first in, last out, or last in, first out process because of the quality of preserved bodies getting better and better as technology improves during time. The first person that's still being um, preserved was frozen in 1974. We, we believe it's not very well preserved, you know, because it was very crude technology at the time, but the technology kept um, improving and people on, on later times kept on being frozen with better technologies. And as time passes, we get better and better preserved bodies until a point in time when people working on the other end, the resurrection technologies, are going to build technologies that's sufficient enough to resurrect the best preserved body, which by definition is going to be the last one that has been frozen because it has been frozen with the best technology. So at this point, when we have this breakthrough of technology, the first person to come back from being frozen will rise again and walk the earth. And as we presumably keep evolving the technology, the resurrection technology, people that have been previously preserved with less advanced technology will be able again to uh, be resurrected and so on and so forth and until hopefully the technology is advanced enough so that we can somehow repair the tissues of the first person. Sorry, that was, um, yeah, okay, you're, you're going to see it again. Uh, <laughs> of the first person that was uh, frozen there and uh, everybody is going to be back with us again or, or with them in the future. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that. So, first thing, last out, this is a very major concept and a, a restriction really to, to, this, uh, to this technology. Now, discussing about its, the ability to technically do it, I cannot say that, I cannot prove that can be done, but also we cannot prove that it cannot be done. 
there is no, let's say, hard scientific limit on achieving the final goal. And also, the problems that we face seem to be the kind of problems that humanity has been proven very good at solving during the years. So working on engineering, and technology, medicine, it's stuff that we do and we get better and we do things that previous generations thought that could not be done. So we can be hopeful about this. Now, apart from the technical skepticism, we have the moral skepticism, and this applies not to time travelers because we don't have that many at the time, but mostly to people who choose cryonics to evade death. For them, uh, people are, you know, have many objections. People say that cryonics is a natural process, it may cause overpopulation if too many people choose not to die and be resurrected in the future. It's selfish, of course. And religious people may claim that it's against goodwill and also why should someone uh, prolong life, you know, because life has a length that is, let's say, optimal and decided by nature. Now, um, there is a, a response to all these criticisms and you may treat death as a disease, okay? So if you treat death as a disease, then you may look into uh, cryonics as a method of cure, let's say. Also, life. We can't claim the same about life. You know, it's a disease that spreads and also has 100% mortality rate. Now, um, for people that say it's unnatural, other people say that so are transplants. They're not very natural, you know, but we use them. For people that say that it was overpopulation, well, actually, this was one of the main um, objections of Malthusian econom economists against vaccines. They said, hey, if we reduce the, the dying rate, you know, uh, people will be too many for this earth. But we still vaccinate people, you know, to avoid their death. I cannot speak very uh, wisely about God's will, but I think nobody else can. And also, this is a personal matter for someone to, to decide, which leaves us with this, that itself is an immoral. And I can understand that because death has been seen by people as a great equalizer, you know, no matter how rich you are or how poor you are, we are all equal in front of death, you know, and if you use your resources to cheat on that, people don't, take to, don't tend to take it very uh, lightly. On that, if we go back to this uh, frame of thought, and if you are a sick person dying, apparently, and you heard that the, in the USA there is a hospital that can offer you a treat, nobody would condemn you for spending all your money to go there and receive this treatment. Now, if this hospital is in the future, which is the case with people that freeze themselves so that they can go to the future and cure themselves, I think nobody should uh, also uh, object to that. And that was a quick scoop of the moral issues to reach the main topic of this presentation, which is the, um, let's say, the motives, uh, skepticism. Even if we could, we, and even if we didn't have any moral problem to do it, would it happen anyway? Would people do it? And this has to do with the um, realization that there are three stages to, to this problem. The first one is vitrification, and it happens very close to you being alive. So you can arrange, and your people that love you can arrange for you and pay for this process. And you can be uh, quite sure that this is going to happen really, you know, because it's very close to the time that you have lived. But then we have the preservation phase that can be very long, can be tens, hundreds or maybe thousands of years, who knows. And um, then we have the resurrection phase where future people will need to take some action, you know, spend some resources, apply their technology in order to bring you back. And during these phases, you will not exist, definitely, and probably most of people that care about you will not exist. So the question is, why would future people care about you? It's a very hard problem, you know, because um, at that point in time, the farther we go into the future, the more irrelevant you're going to be. You're going to be irrelevant on all aspects. Consider a prehistoric person arriving to this day and think about its, his or her relevance to this day. Um, you'd have a, a language barrier, presumably. I mean, if I bring, bring an ancient Greek to discuss with me, we couldn't tell what each other says, you know? Um, even if it's a 
language that has been continuous, you know, for three or four thousand years. Also, you will have a tremendous lack of skills to be embedded in the future society. You will have no friends or relatives to integrate you. And maybe they will see you as a bearer of vulgar beliefs. Our moral system, we cannot be sure that it's going to exist in the future. You know, the future generations may choose to live in another way and you'll be a total foreigner at this environment. So it's a very, very hard problem. How can we, from this point of time, impose our will to future people, which are going to be total strangers to us and also be godlike to us? Because I don't believe that anybody has any doubt that these people, compared to what we can do today, are going to be like gods, as we are gods compared to the ancient people. So this is a very hard problem. And to me, this has been the most valid criticism about why this wouldn't work. I mean, if you were the first person to be out of, be brought out of being frozen, I can see some value there, you know, because they can um, examine you, historical reasons and so on. But what if you are one of the one millionth person to be unfrozen? You know, your, your marginal value to the future community is going to be very small, if any. So, why would they do it? Some people may say that, okay, you have a contract and you have to enforce a contract, but I cannot think of any contract from the past 500 years that are still enforceable today. So this wouldn't, I wouldn't take this. Um, I have thought of this, it's a mind exercise, you know, the domino of love, as I, as, as I call it. So the idea, oh, come on. The idea is you get frozen, but you, before you get frozen, you make the arrangements, save for some money and also convince your kids to be frozen. If, as tra time travelers or before they die. And they have to tell them that they have to convince their kids to be frozen and so on and so forth. So that you, had, you build a chain, you know, of people that know the previous people until the some time that a future ancestor of yours who doesn't know you and doesn't give a shit about you uh, is at the point where he was around recently and the technology came up and he can be resurrected by his or her children, you know, and then rises up and remembers his or her parents and vouches for them to be resurrected and so on and so forth until you reach to your kids. And if you are a good parent, they would miss you, you know, and they make the best they can to, uh, to raise you. Okay. This would make a great movie, I think, but I, it's, uh, too, I mean, yeah, think about this, yeah? but uh, too many things could go wrong in this process. You know, some, some kids may hate their fathers, may not have kids or they may go broke or whatever. So, uh, we may disregard this. What else? You are a very, exceptional, a very exceptional person. If you are Mozart, or if you are so exceptional like Mozart, then future people would like to resurrect you, you know? If we were given the opportunity to bring Mozart back, I'm sure we make great effort to bring Mozart back. And um, for these people, the very exceptional people, this would work. These people could be mostly, I guess, artists or maybe spiritual people that still would have a following and people would like to see them come back. It wouldn't work with technologists whose uh, skills would be obsolete, I guess. Uh, celebrities, sports people and so on. Yeah. So this, this is a very nice part of the population that could use cryonics without, uh, but it's not a blanket solution. Um, in the future, you may have untapped genetic material uh, due to pollution or uh, some, uh, I don't know, uh, plague that has broken out or maybe a flare going out of the sun and radiation destroying the genetic material. Your genetic material, you being an ancient person, could be of some use for the people in the future. But they could take it without waking you up, you know, so it, this also wouldn't make you very valuable conscious people to them, just a body that they can reuse maybe. So this goes. This is the best thing we can hope for if we go for the time travel with uh, cryonics, that there will be a fr future cryonic community that will care, as we have activists today to care for animals, you know, for or other type of special interests. There might be in the future some minority who thinks that the frozen people are still people and they have their rights and they vouch for their rights to be preserved. It's very hard to, to stake your life to this, but this could be also an option. So we have a very s slim case here about why would f future people care so that they could bring us back to, to life. Apart from this one, 
they want to resurrect you because you know a secret. If you know a secret that's very valuable, then people may want to bring you back. Now, this secret could not be gossip, I guess, because gossip of this time would not be very interesting in the future. Also, would not be state secrets because states probably would have changed form in the future. So, what secret could it be? You may have a secret to a hidden treasure, something that has monetary value. Yes. And this would make you a person of interest for the future society. Now, what this treasure could be? Could it be um, a chest full of gold, I guess? Up until now, the only way to transfer value to the far future is to bury gold somewhere and hope that in 100 years or 200 years, give instructions to someone to go and find it. Um, there's a prob two problems with that. The first is, in order for the people to be interested in you, you have to prove ownership. You have to prove that you know the secret. In order to prove ownership of gold, you have to reveal the gold. You have to show the gold. Otherwise, why would someone believe that you know that you have gold in your possession that they can find? And also, it can be accidentally taken, you know, because somebody else digged where you have hidden it. So this wouldn't work. I think you know what where, where this is going. Yes, your secret is a private key. For, um, for a crypto address, okay? Now, this is um, much more interesting. It's something that we have as an option only for 10 years now. So, um, this would entitle you to, uh, to, um, to a treasure, and people would know exactly how much it, this treasure is valued. And this treasure would be in your mind. So your mind would have to be resurrected intact with its memories so that this could become valuable for anybody in the future, yes? So this would work for this because there is money and people would resurrect you, but also would work for this and I'll tell you in a while how this would work. Okay. To be exact, it would not be a private key to a crypto address. It would be the private keys of two out of two multisig address. And the actual way that this would be set up is that you would. Um, oh, sorry. To explain what the two out of do you know what two out of two multi address is for people that would, who don't know, it resembles to this. You know how we launch the nukes. We have two keys. The one has the president has one, and the general has one, and then they put it, they turn it in movies, they press the button, and the missiles fly. The same uh, idea is with the uh, multi sig addresses. Uh, if you set it up like this, two different persons or two different keys have to be used in order for the money to be released out of a two out of two um, multisig address. So you create a two out of two multisig address and you fund it and this is something public. You have to memorize the one key and give the other one to the company that's going to freeze you. Now this is a bit tricky. When we're talking about memorizing this, we have you have to memorize it in your long-term long memory. The uh, common uh, understanding is that our short-term memory is in our current electrical, um, how can I say it? You know, setup of the mind. But if they freeze you, this goes away. So when you wake up, your short-term memory is going to be gone. But your long-term memory is the structure of your synapses in your brain, and if this will be preserved when you wake up. What is in your long term memory is going to be still to be there. So you're going to have to memorize it and go back to the company every six months, let's say for a couple of years and sign small transactions out of the, this two out of two multi sig address to demonstrate that you still remember it so that they can be sure that you remember it and it's still it's, the, it's, the, it's in your long term memory before they sign with you to freeze you. Because if you, if you don't remember this, there's no money, you know, in the end. Now, the, the final transaction that will move money out of your uh, this, this address could be a matter of negotiation and contract, apparently. You could say that 80% goes to them and 20% comes to you. Um, you may say, I don't give you anything, but I don't think that you can hustle with the future people, you know, so effectively they're going to be cut. I believe the more most um, probable result is, is that they're going to strong arm you to get everything. Okay, and you have to design for this that you're going to wake up 
and they're going to make you give the whole fund to them. So it's better if you have a second address, not known to anybody, also memorize it, so that when you wake up in the future, you arrive as a, as a rich tourist and not as a poor immigrant to the future. You know, you have to have some money, otherwise your life's not going to be very good. So, I discussed about the vitrification, you pay now, and your fund pays in the future. What happens with the preservation period? This period might be very long and can be very costly, as you realize. And you're going to have generations of people working for this company, paying your electric bill, um, guard you from people trying to steal your body for ransom or from terrorists who want to attack you or whatever might happen in 100 years in the future. This has a cost. How are we going to pay for this? You have to start to think about your body after you sign this as being a company asset. For them, you represent a future cash flow against which they can issue bonds or they can securitize, sell stock in order to finance their, their ongoing operations. And in that way, you can give an answer to how all these three stages are going to be funded. Now, I discuss about how we're going to enable time travel with crypto and the next part of my presentation is going to discuss what crypto and how much of it. So I am not a maximalist, okay? But I, I, would, go with, I would go with Bitcoin at the moment. Um, I'm not saying that in the future Bitcoin will not be surpassed by other cryptocurrencies or new forms of cryptocurrencies will not be invented by future people. We cannot discount or their ingenuity and their energy. It's, I don't think it's, it's very, a very smart thing to do. But from the current crop of uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin should be it. Because even if it in the future is not the main cryptocurrency that pe people use it, being the first crypto cryptocurrency would still assign to it some collectibles value, let's say. So at the current moment, this is your best chance. Um, now, discussing about how much crypto, we have to make some considerations about the value of this crypto that's going to be frozen with you. And um, going back to this, this schematic, um, the, if you think from the, from the side of the company, the expected gain, what they expect to get from you when you are frozen, is the product of the staked value that you have uh, in, in Bitcoin uh, times the success probability if they unfreeze you at a point in time. So um, if you have been frozen at this point of time and you have the breakthrough there, from the break, Opa. ooh, sorry. Ah, froze me if I have an accident, yeah. You have to freeze me. Okay. Now from this moment on, you might have slight probability of success because you are not a very well-preserved body, you know, at the beginning, but the probability is going to rise following a sigma function maybe and reach a plateau in the future where at this point it would be the better time for you to be uh, resurrected. But they may choose to do it in an earlier time with you and if they do it in an earlier time their expected gain from you is going to be less and less. Now we have to take into consideration our expectations about what happens with the price. So if they expect that the price is going to rise in the future there will not be much of a hurry. You know they can wait so that the probability is being maximized because the asset is going to be appreciated anyway. But if some, for some reason they believe that the price is going to fall, then maybe they will sell el earlier. They're going to get weak hands and they may not hold you. Yeah, because you, you, you're, yeah, you're, you're an asset, yes? So th this, this is something for someone who expects your value to fall is to liquidate you, you know, they go for it with some probability to restore you and get whatever money they can get from you and the other bodies of your uh, segment, let's say. Um, another thing that's very interesting about this is that staking is going to be a transparent market. And this because if you want to attract investors and securitize, you know, issue stock or get loans in order to keep operating, you have to communicate with the public how many uh, bodies of time travelers or people corpses you have really and how much um, how much money they each of one of them has staked so that to justify the value that you have there so as you have people starting to freeze and stake bitcoin the free float of bitcoin because bitcoin that's actually free to be transacted is going to fall yeah and this would create 
um, a pressure for the price to go up as the available Bitcoin goes down. So when uh, this will make the money that people have staked previously um, be of much higher value in the future, because if they had staked $1,000, let's say here, it's too much time, you know, and we appreciate very much while here it's about the same. Um, and then we get the breakthrough and the first people start to be resurrected. And then the um, supply of Bitcoin, new Bitcoin comes and froze, you know, and comes out to the market. So the supply goes up and the price would begin to fall, to, to fall. At which point your um, value superimposed with your success probability would look like this and would make the company liquidate you at a earlier point that is optimal for you. I would expect companies, you know, to run to the door, you know, to liquidate their but it's as early as possible, it's going to be like a, a bank run, maybe. So it's, it's a complete, yes, because the first one goes there, you know, gets more money. So it's, um, it's, it's an interesting economic topic, you know, it's multivariant, also has to do with uh, uh, game theory and so on. And I expect people in the future maybe to have some PhDs on this, you know, and uh, maybe study this more. Um, in general, I would say it's the more you can stake, the better. And um, you have to divide your wealth to how much money you're going to keep for your personal usage when you arrive there and how much money you're going to stake so that you will be preserved for, um, for as long as it's required. Um, I'm not saying what I produced yeah, has many assumptions. And I'm here to, here to tell you that we can wear our jumpsuits you know, and travel to the future right now. We could. Um, but in order for this to work end to end, too many things have to be in the right place. Okay, so we have to have humanity, you know, survive, which is not a given. Okay, we're going to touch probability to that. Also, civilization of humanity has to survive, and this civilization civilization has to be affluent, because if future people have problems, you know, with going by, they are not going to care with you or your crypto. You know, they have to to to, to resolve their own problems and. Definitely, they will not be very welcoming to new people arriving to a distressed uh, civilization. We need the science to work out, but I'm very positive that eventually this will happen. And um, also, we want the political climate not to become hostile. You have to think about this, you know. In the future, we may have um, a global populist government that chooses to put the frozen people in trial for their crimes against humanity, for pollution they have created, for how they have treated animals, or our crimes we don't think about, but future people are going to condemn us about us. We condemn the ancient people about slavery and whatever else they, they did. And so they may choose to uh, disconnect us. This, this is a risk. Or uh, maybe some religion may say that, you know, this is unnatural and these people shouldn't come back or whatever. So this has not to happen. Um, your crypto needs to survive. It's sense. And uh, also your company needs to stay in business and not be destroyed by external attacks. People may attack it to steal your body for ransom or you have terrorists or whatever. And this is very important. You have to hope that the crypto winters are going to be few and are going to be mild so that they can keep hold on you and they can keep finance themselves through holding your assets. Um, I've calculated these probabilities. I've assigned pessimistic and um, optimistic values to each one of them, um, multiplied them and arrived at this range of this working. This is my estimation. You know, you are free to make your own calculations. And I will um, admit that this is a very small percentage for someone to take his or her life. Um, but we have to think this bet we're going to take, what's the value of winning it? You know, how, what's the value of living in the future? And many things may come in the future, you know, we may have space travel or we may come to symbiosis with AI or may reach alternative states of uh, consciousness or even achieve mortality, which I think is a prospect there. Probably we are the last or of the, of the last generations to die and that would be very unfortunate. And whatever else we cannot think about, you know, as ancient people could not think of this, what's happening now. So what's the value of living in the future? To me, it's infinite. 
if you think about it. So we have a Pascal's wager here, where if you multiply where the half percent of infinite is infinite, and even five billionth of infinite is infinite. So in the rational terms, it makes sense to you know, make the leap and uh, try to access the future. Thank you. Thank you. I almost, I almost killed myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So thank you very much for the talk. I'm really happy that I didn't give a long introduction because we have uh, more time for questions okay. and uh, it uh, really did speak for itself. So my first question, uh, I have the privilege to start, of course. Uh, is um, uh, our previous speaker, Robin Hansen, he wrote a book uh, called The Age of M uh, about the world where we could copy uh, the structure of, uh, of the brain and resurrect people in the cloud. So they become, uh, there, there will become copies of them in the cloud. And this has many implications for this scenario. So one of them is uh, why to resurrect you if they can just uh, read the key from the structure of your brain and just spend the coins. They don't need to wake you up actually. And um, it's really interesting because uh, at least from electrical signals right now we can uh, reconstruct <laughs> no, yeah. uh, we can reconstruct uh, dreams right now so maybe in the future uh, if you can kind of scan uh, uh, scan scan the structure of the brain you could say okay there's in the long-term memory there is a way how to store the private key and just extract it and spend the coins hopefully Okay, I cannot, I mean, there are many things to discuss about this. The first is, I'm not sure if I would like to wake up in such an environment where somebody could read my mind. You know, we have our ultimate privacy in our thoughts right now. Try to think of a future where you don't have this anymore. It would be, uh, it, the, would be it would be hell. But freezing could be the prerequisite for that. So maybe we, uh, the freezing could be the prerequisite for that. So maybe only frozen that brains sliced could be read so I'm, i yeah, I, don't, I mean it's this, spe this speculation this yes, one thing yes. and the second thing is let's hope that the resurrection technology arrives before the, the scanning yes. technology you know so probably i should put another probability there to reduce the so have you discussed or are you going to discuss uh, this idea with any cryogenic company like alcor come, come again if you are going to like uh, discuss uh, this with any cryogenic company I haven't. I, I, I don't need to discuss anything, you know, all things I have thought about this are there. They can take it from there, you know, and proceed. So it's mostly um, this kind of thought experiment um, was generated by the realization that you can transfer wealth into the future with crypto and then thinking about what would be the potential uh, applications of this. And this seems to be like a very interesting topic to make future people do things that you want now so I, probably I mean I don't know if this is a good idea which I, I cannot say 100% that's a good idea you know there are so many holes you, you can poke on it you know but if you think of the alternatives how this is going to be funded for 500 years or why would they I mean the compared to all the other reasons why you would be resurrected I think this holds the most more water even if for some people it may not be you know, convincing, so. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. It's a, it was a very interesting idea. Uh, just one comment. You probably need some sort of incentive for the person that gets unfrozen to release the funds. So probably what's going to happen is that the allocation will not be 100 and zero, will be something like, I don't know, 99 and 1%. Because then the person, when it gets unfrozen, to get that 100, 1%, it needs to, to sign uh, a transaction. I, I agree. I th said 20 or 80 or something, but you know what? They are going to be super powerful. So you will not have much leverage. See what I mean? I mean, even now you can get people to talk about anything, <laughs> admit any crime with today's technology. Think about future technology of inflicting pain or whatever might that be. How, yeah, how, how, how effective this is going to be to make you talk. I mean, I wouldn't expect that if, because they are going to resurrect you and there will not be law enforcement around, you know, it's just you and them and they know that you have a treasure and uh, if human nature keeps the way it is today, 
my expectation is that cannot work work very well for you. Maybe I don't know. Um, if if you um, um, if you like um, if um, the gap between someone losing consciousness and getting it back, would it would it like feel instant for them or not? I, I, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Can you can you repeat a bit louder, would, please? Would it feel like sort of instant to travel through time using cryogenic? The thing is, for the rest of the world, it wouldn't be instant. But for you, being frozen it would be instant. So, from your perspective, yes. you you go into a tank and then you get out of it and you're in the future. Well, yeah. Magic, yeah. Another good thing about this method, which all other methods do not have. It's the spatial problem, you know? If I zap myself into the future right now, I will end up in empty space because the galaxy and the solar system and Earth would have moved, you know, away from this, from this point of, uh, of space. So all these movies that show you that someone goes into the future into the same spot on Earth, where Earth is somewhere else really, you know, and uh, it moves in a certain way and they don't fall down even, you know? They have the, the inertia that's needed so that they land like this and it's, uh, it's absurd really, yeah? So if you travel to the future with the Earth, the solar system and the galaxies, it would make a better landing for you in the future. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, I have a comment and a question. So I'm a bit more skeptical uh, in general, um, and I think like it's probably mostly motivated. So my comments like it's probably mostly motivated out of the fear of death. This whole discussion, uh, and here comes my question, um, which goes along the lines that I think we are different to machines. Probably that we are aware of our own limitations. That we're going to die at some point, and this death probably gives us kind of a meaning or like living our life in uh -huh. a way. Um, and my question to you is, um, do you see any purpose in death or is there something positive associated? Uh, you mean from a moral standpoint? Just uh, your the, point, the, yeah. the, 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 the probability is that you're going to die, okay? So you, take, you do this and you die. So the fear of, of life ending is going to still to be there. This is the first thing. The second thing is, I cannot speak of my future self. I wouldn't do it now because if you... If you saw what I was discussing here, it's better to do it as late as possible so that you get better preserved and be one of the people that's first resurrected and you don't have to be in preservation too long. So um, the, um, if you want to maximize your probabilities, better, it's better to wait. Um, the thing is, you're going to be an old body. And you may say, you know what, in the future you may build your body up and so on, so th there is a trade-off there. Now, it's interesting that there are some people that have cho had chosen to do it, and then uh, arriving in the doorstep of the death, let's say, they decided not to, and they went out to be burned and so on. So I don't know how, I mean, I guess evolution has programmed us to embrace death after we reach some age, you know, our body gives us signals about things not working very well, and probably that's time to go. But there are some people, you know, that are still full of energy and that they feel that they have been born early, maybe in humans' development and want to see what's going to happen in the future. I mean, if you were born like 3,000 years ago, you, have, you would have missed all of this. Think about that. It's, and now we're going to miss everything, you know, for the future. This, if you think about this, it's a very hard thing to cope with. Come again? Yes. But it's a good, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good kind of FOMO, you know. Also, think about this, about the moral standpoint, if you think that you can evade death. I think people that are going to freeze themselves are going to make um, decisions that will help humanity to be preserved. So you're going to protect the environment because you're going to be in this environment in the future, you know. You you're not, you're, will not be a person that came here, consumed whatever they want and just left. You are vested with the future of humanity. So if you are this kind of person, I believe to how other people see you, you, are a, you, you could seem a better person. See what I mean? So only positive things there. So one thing that struck me during your talk is uh, that due to the development of the society to like go like creatures, I most probably won't be a cool Marty McFly you, uh, you showed on the last slide. I might be more like a Neanderthal uh, with a huge pile of money, which, which doesn't sound very attractive to me, right? For uh, the time traveler, you mean? Yes. So wouldn't this weigh everything else down that I'm just a very dumb Asian creature uh, which has a lot of money? I, I, 
I, I don't know how the future, I mean, it's a concern, you know, even in this age, we have people arriving from other countries, they're contemporary people, you know, they can be trained. And still this creates huge social tensions. We're talking about immigration now. And I realize that if, if you immigrate from the past, this is going to be even worse. You're going to be an alien like someone landed. And I've been discussing with friends, you know, about uh, movies that we can create about future, uh, um, about the possible future where these people uh, are being frozen and then reach to a number that become a threat to that society and then come to conflict and try to, you know, in the end, the ancient win. That would be a good ending. Um, uh, it's it's going to be interesting, I, I tell you. But again, you would be an individual whose record would be available to future people, you know? We are in information age, whatever I say, I do. My criminal record, you know, the, testi the testimony of my friends and so on, speak about me. So I'm not just an ancient person, it's Spiros Dovas who has come from 2050 or something. And hopefully they will judge me for that and not that I... Also, they may judge me as a brave person, you know, because I took this step while others didn't. I don't know. It's... You have to wait and see. Uh, sure beats being dead. Eh? <laughs> oh, sure I mean, if, if, you com dead. if you compare it with <laughs> terminal, eternal death, yeah. if you compare this with you not existing ever again, yeah. And then you have the possibility of you existing and maybe your kids making it and your grandkids making it, you know, think about your friends making it. It's, you cannot, I mean, you cannot, it's these two, don't, cannot go to the, to the same scale. Huh? Okay. Thank you very much for your oh, talk. You. Uh, I suggest everyone to talk to Spiros when he's yeah, around. Okay. Uh, thank you.